So let's jump back to the scientific method. Um, so something to keep in mind is that uh, we haven't always done science the way we do it today. Now we've been doing science this way, in, at least in the Western world, for about 500 years. Um, and we can credit, sort of, uh, Sir Francis Bacon. Uh, he's a British fellow who uh, wrote it out very clearly. This is the scientific method, and he shared it with his fellow, uh, they called themselves naturalists back then, biologists. Um, and these you know, groups of primarily European men um, did a lot of work with that. They studied phenomena and they used the scientific method to document it. And the earliest scientific journals were actually just basically book clubs of these people sharing letters with each other with their data. Um, so you'll notice as we go through, and where I can, I will try to drop in other examples so that it's not quite so Eurocentric. Um, but a lot of, especially the biology, has a strong Western vibe just because that's where it was really well documented. Um, but there was lots of good science being done all over the world. Um, some of it was well documented, some of it wasn't. Um, the creation of like gunpowder and uh, fireworks in, in well, wasn't China at the time, but that part of Asia uh, is, you know, is really neat and really well documented. Um, advanced mathematics in what was at the time Persia, but it's now uh, Iran, Iraq area um you know lots of cool science being done all over the place and like where i can I'll, I'll try to give you examples um, that fit in but especially the stuff done oh, the last hundred years it's gonna have it's gonna have a heavy eurocentric um feel to it but just um you know you can go out and find like even when i don't have time to give you more there's there's stuff out there um that's really interesting to read and i'll try to remember to give you guys some extra maybe a link or something you can check out. Okay. All right. So Sir Francis Bacon, he wrote this thing out and he shared it with lots of people. And that was in the 15, late 1500s. So because he did that, um, we, we have this clear kind of pathway for doing science. Um, now it's earliest discussions of this kind of science. It goes back to even like Aristotle. All right. So this, this isn't like, it's not just the last 500 years, but well documented the last 500 years. All right, so what are we doing? We're gonna have an observation. So I'm gonna give you a silly example, but my toaster doesn't toast my bread. Huh, so you ask a question. Why doesn't my toaster work? Now you can form a hypothesis. Well, there must be something wrong with the electrical outlet. My toaster didn't work. There's something wrong with the electrical outlet, okay. So we can then create an if-then statement to define our prediction clearly. If something is wrong with the outlet, my coffee maker also won't work when plugged into it. Okay, so we had our toaster plugged into an outlet. If I unplug it and plug my coffee maker into it, the coffee maker should not work. That would tell us that the outlet is the problem, right? So we have our experiment. We're going to, right, our experiment is unplug the toaster, plug in the coffee maker <laughs> to the same outlet. Um, and it has a clear like yes or no to the prediction. If there's something wrong with the outlet, when I plug the coffee maker into it, my coffee maker is not going to turn on. If there's not something wrong with the outlet, when I plug my coffee maker in, the coffee maker is going to work. Okay. So we perform the experiment. We plug the coffee maker into the outlet. And if the coffee maker works, then there was not a problem with the outlet, right? If the coffee maker doesn't work, then there's something wrong with the outlet. Okay, so you know we have to kind of go through the supported, unsupported. So I'm gonna one second here. All right, so I've got this nice little little graph from your um, table, I guess, uh, from your textbook. When we get down after the experiment, you know, is your hypothesis supported? So we'll use our coffee maker and our toaster. I unplugged the toaster, I plugged in the coffee maker. The coffee maker does not turn on. Is my hypothesis supported? Yes, because my hypothesis was that if there's something wrong with the outlet, then when I plug my coffee maker into it, the coffee maker won't turn on. And that's what happened. Ta-da, now I can show those results. However, 
if I plug the coffee maker in and it does work, my hypothesis is not supported. There's nothing wrong with the outlet. So now I have to go back and come up with a new hypothesis. There's nothing wrong with the outlet. There's something else wrong with the toaster. And, you know, maybe you have to try to figure out, you know, what's wrong with the toaster. Um, you know, I guess for most of us, once a toaster stops working, you toss it out. But in the sciences, you might be talking about you know, any number of things. Uh, you know, why treatment with one drug only works, you know, 50% of the time. Or, right, lots, lots of different options there. So if your hypothesis is unsupported, you need a new hypothesis, a new experiment, and you go in and you do it and you get your results. And you keep doing that until you find an answer. This is why there's a lot of failure in science. So, you know, you, we make the best predictions we can, but depending on the situation, you may, you may have to try a lot of different ways to get at the answer, or you may get an odd answer um, that requires further investigation. So it's, it's an ongoing, long process. Okay, so we've done all that work. We've got our data. Now we need to share it. <laughs> um, and we don't just share the data from one experiment. That's, or we're very, very rarely at least. Um, you'll, you'll be looking at like a broader project because when we publish our work, we're telling a story. We're telling a story of a problem we saw or something curious we encountered and how we worked out what it is, okay? So in, in a way it is a type of storytelling. It's a storytelling of natural phenomenon. So in order to do that, we, we usually write it up, though we also do um, like in-person like presentations of our work too. Um, and you have to present your data in such a way that they, you, reviewers, we use peer review, right? So peer, so our fellow scientists will look at the work and determine if we did it properly. Um, and that involves looking at the methods we used, what kind of experiment was it, looking at the data we got from the experiment and seeing if they too come to the same conclusion that we would have come to. All of that information has to be in our publication so that anybody with the appropriate level of knowledge, another expert in the field, could look at it and say with reasonable uh, certainty that they would interpret the data the same way that, that say, I did. That's, that's what you're going for. Um, sometimes we send out our papers and they come back with notes from the reviewers saying, hey, you know, I really would like to see this additional experiment. I, I think you've made a good point, but it would be good to see that, you know, shown a little more clearly, whatever. And so you do. You, you go out, you add another experiment, maybe even two. You get the results and then you, you know, update your work and you send it back. It's a very, very common part of the process. Um, and... It's, it makes our work better, it makes it more reliable, uh, it makes our conclusions stronger when we work together that way. Um, that process is typically done anonymously. So uh, like, for example, like I, I do um, peer review for um, a couple of different journals in my specializations and they send me a paper. I don't know who wrote the paper. They don't, they don't give us that kind of information. Uh, I just have what they've, they've written, their data and their results, their own conclusions. And I, it's my job to look at those things and see if I too come to those same conclusions um, or if I think there's a gap or a problem. And I, I've yet to get a paper that I didn't send back with some notes to make it better. But, um, you know, and I've yet to send out a paper that didn't get notes back to make it better. Um, but that's, that's good, it's part of the process. It, it improves uh, it improves everything that we're all doing. Um, something that's really important is that peer-reviewed scientific journals should not be confused with popular media. Um, not that there's anything wrong necessarily with popular media, that, that's okay. And you can even get good science from that stuff, like, um, is it uh, Science Daily, um, Nature, was it, not, the, not Nature the big journal, but Nature, Nature of Science, something like that. Anyway, there's tons of them. Those are considered like tertiary. So in the sciences, when we, when we put out our results. We're doing that in primary peer-reviewed literature. So that means that the work is coming directly from me, the scientist and their team who did it, and it's been reviewed by other experts in the field and they agree that the, the results are valid. In more popular science, what often happens is 
people that do have some specialization will take peer-reviewed work and then they'll write up nice little pieces that anybody could understand to explain a general, you know, oh, we discovered a new, you know, a new treatment for Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And here's the basics of it. But they're not going to tell you, you know, the high level, oh, you know, this protein has this amino acid off and it caused, you know, it's not going to go into that level of detail. Um, and, you know, and that's fine. You know, we need, we need media out there for advanced level scientists who can, you know, look at the results and come up with new experiments and keep the work moving forward. And we also need to be putting out information for, for the lay person so that they're familiar with, you know, the work that's going on. Um, but you just have to be really clear that, that they're two very different things. Um, and the kinds of stuff you'll read are very different. The level of understanding is really different. Um, and then of course there are people who have no, no specialization whatsoever and just start talking. Um, always check the person's credentials. Who, who are you and why do you have authority to talk about this topic um, before trusting what it, whatever it is they're saying. All right, so we did it. <laughs> we made it through all of chapter one. Um, we'll come back and meet you here for chapter two. Uh, make sure that you take a look in the textbook at the you know, there's review questions, the, the summary of the different sections, and please, by all means, reach out to me if you have any questions. All right, see you next time.